And we're meeting on. Greetings, dear friends. We gather in our circle following the new moon of Scorpio, the great festival of Diwali celebrated in many countries with uh, Hinduism as the main religion, celebrating, thus celebrating the victory of light over darkness. And so today we come in our circle, bringing our focus to the topic, sharing responsibility through trust, unity, and love. With this meeting today, we bring together the results of our meditation since the full moon when we started holding focus on this topic, invoking the Scorpio energies. And today we have opportunity again to share our impressions and to offer seeds that will grow, becoming thought forms that together through our meditation, we will magnetize and radiate towards humanity. Thus, inspiring thinkers and leaders of human family leading humanity towards the Aquarian blossoming civilization. Let us begin our work. And I invite Birgit to sound the statement of purpose. Our purpose is to magnetize the ideas of common good, freedom, and brotherhood as the highest values of humanity at this time. We recognize and share its diversity of perspectives in our group, creating a space capable of invoking, receiving, interpreting, and radiating a higher synthetic vision. We serve as an ashramic outpost, building a group bridge of Buddhic energy. We evoke the soul of humanity. We envision humanity as being the seed that is flowering. We prepare the way for the reappearance of the coming one. And let us do our naming circle. Over to you, Tracy. Thank you, Brigitte. And thank you everybody for being here today. As we begin our focus today in this new moon meditation, the naming circle unites our hearts across distance as we begin to align and bring ourselves fully into our group work. By uniting our hearts in this way, we begin naturally to work telepathically through our group mind. The key to this telepathic work is in the etheric alignment, which creates the group field and allows it to become both a receiving and transmitting agent 
for higher ideas and energies. We will begin by calling our names into the circle, starting with our organizers. And as your name is called, please unmute yourself, say your name, and where you are calling in from. For example, Tracy Arbor calling in from Novi, Michigan, USA. And as we go through this, let us turn our attention to our hearts and the heart center of the group gathered today as each one of us calls ourself into this circle. Alexander. Hello, friends, again, um, I'm Alexander. Ilchuk, and today I am calling in from Cyprus. Welcome. Birgitta. Greetings. I'm Birgitta Rasmussen, calling in from Denmark. Welcome. Andrea. Hello, everyone. I am Andrea, and I'm calling from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in the United States. Welcome. Jillian. Hello, everyone. It's Jillian Douglas from Norfolk, UK. Welcome. Kiki. Hello, Kiki Bill from Washington, D.C., USA. Welcome. Helen. Hello, Helen Franklin. I'm calling in from Hertfordshire in UK. Welcome. Annetta. And we, can. we can hear you. All the problems with the microphone. Welcome, Aneta. Vicky. Hi, everyone. I'm Vicky Pazzurati, and I'm calling from Olympia, Greece. Welcome. Judy. Hello, this is Judy Harrison. I'm calling from Brewster, Massachusetts, USA. Welcome. Lynn. This is Lynn Green, and I'm in Columbus, Ohio, USA. Welcome. And Annetta is joining us. She just has a problem with her microphone. So welcome, everyone. And now that we are linked together as a group, let us share a few moments in silence to align, forming a triangle between Shambhala, the hierarchy, and humanity. May our efforts be of the highest vibration in selfless service for our purpose.
Thank you, friends. We come now to continue our sharing. We started with the full moon and continued throughout our quarter moon meeting. Holding in focus our topic, sharing responsibility through trust, unity, and love. And as we do this, we hold in the background of our group focus that this topic being selected and integrated from impressions related to the theme of a Russian theme that we hold throughout the science of the fixed cross, introducing the principle of sharing into the field of all human affairs. So as we share and listen to each other's sharings, let's us hold the focus high, recognizing the essence of each sharing and listening for resonance. On the screen, you can see now the questions that Tracy offered uh, to the group at the full moon, inviting us to take those questions into meditation to help us to focus our reflection on the topic. So we open the floor now, preparing um, to do our meditation through our sharing and offering the seed thoughts. Tracy, maybe you could uh, read the questions again, bringing our focus uh, for the sharing. Okay, no problem. The first question was, what is the essence in the virtue trust that must be mastered within each of us and humanity in general to ensure success? What is the essence in the virtue trust that must be mastered within each of us and humanity in general to ensure success? The second question. How does uninhibited sharing of responsibility support freedom and freedom of choice? How does uninhibited sharing of responsibility support freedom and freedom of choice? And the third question, love is the fundamental principle and law of the universe. Mankind has learned about this law through shared pain and sorrow. How can mankind bring forth new ways to master this principle and law on a higher, finer note? How can mankind bring forth 
new ways to master the principle of love and the law of love on a higher, finer note. Yes, I'll start. I've actually been thinking about the second question. How does the uninhibited sharing of responsibility, how does it support freedom and freedom of choice? I think just the word uninhibited sharing of responsibility means there is no restriction. Therefore, there is freedom. And freedom to choose is the choice of the uninhibited uninhibited sharing. We have a choice to restrain ourselves and restrict ourselves and not allow ourselves to share um, our half of or our part of the responsibility just by being responsible for ourselves. I think by, by sharing our own responsibility, being responsible for ourselves, it allows tremendous freedom within ourselves. Um, and that translates obviously over to um, helping others to free themselves, sharing by um, by example. If everyone showed responsibility for themselves and that's what was shown on the media or whatever, um, you know, they're always showing irresponsibility. And um, I think if we just flip that and do the opposite of the coin and become responsible, I think that would really blast open the doors for freedom for everyone. I think a lot of people are kind of afraid to take things on either because they may fail or they don't feel like they want to do it, or they can't, whatever reason that they have. And I think that freedom of choice for them to make that choice is, has always been there. But hopefully, the freedom of choice will turn more towards sharing responsibility and not being afraid, having the freedom of not being afraid to be who you are and share who you are. Thank you. I'll pick up on that, Tracy, because I think where you started to tap into and where I go in the third question is, is truly a paradigm shift um, in terms of the media. We turn on the television and we are all fed fear through stories of horror, stories that are uh, of not goodness. And I think that there are places and you're beginning to see it in some aspect of the general news broadcast where instead of talking only about stories that generate fear that oftentimes and generally at the end of the news hour there is something plugged that focuses on 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 goodness and I, I just think it, it 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 is such a powerful vehicle for communicating to, to to the masses that if we were to shift into the acknowledgement of all of the wonderful things that are happening, that that could really shift consciousness. And and in that, I'll share that I have been involved with an extraordinary organization that was created in the 1920s by Andrew Carnegie, and it's called the Carnegie Hero Fund. And every year, 
we recognize stories of heroism and acknowledge them and promote them and award and, and award those who have selflessly shown that they are willing to step forward in rescue and in 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 aspects of, of selflessness that are to strangers. And we're finding as an organization that there are more and more of these heroic stories coming to our desk. And we are also beginning to see the media turning its attention to this organization, which for us is is very positive because the intention of Andrew Carnegie was to, to, to really recognize the common good that is within humanity, that is there in the selfless acts of heroism. So I think that it's really this extraordinary shift that has to happen that recognizes the good news instead of the bad news. And there's a wonderful um, online publication called the Good News Network, which I get every day and is filled with stories of optimism and, and, and wonderful aspects that humanity is bringing forth that, that really is a part of that shift because it's going to have to be a shift of consciousness that goes from fear to love. I would love to see um, the news media, um, um, well, they need to identify problems, but I'd love to see them um, with each problem identified to show an example of someone who is solving that problem. Um, I think that would change things a lot too. Um, um, also, um, what, what you were saying, Tracy, about um, freedom and responsibility I think you can go the opposite way too and say um, with no with no big bosses, with nobody trying to tell everyone what to do, if people have freedom of choice, um, it uh, brings about acceptance of responsibility too. You got somebody has to step up if there's no one telling everyone what to do. And I think that's um, part of our problem uh, in the US anyway is that uh, there are so many people still looking for someone to tell them what to do, um, and it it causes the uh, demagogues and that sort of thing um, to come forth and mislead people. Um, also, I was going to share an example of something that I think um, builds trust, and this is so simple, but... Um, um, with a preschool that, that I, I sent my son to, they um, help people um, self-realize and build trust by, uh, it's so simple, but by, in the children, um, if they are upset about something, they, they first of all recognize the feelings of that child. They don't say, you can't feel that way. That's wrong. You shouldn't have hit him. You're, you're, you're bad, bad, bad. Instead, they say, oh, I see that you're really angry. I see that something has made you really angry. And then the child can say what it was. And then they can turn it around and help the child. They'll say to that child, I can't let you hurt anyone, but maybe there's some other way. And so they might make an angry painting or they might, um, they, sometimes there's nothing else that's needed, but they find a way to express their, help them find a way to express their feelings constructively. And um, it's so simple, but it's so brilliant. In young children, they do this with children two, three, four, five, and it sets a course for their lives um, of correct, correct use of emotion. Uh, and emotion being such a, such a problem for, for, for all of us at this time, uh, as far as society is concerned, at least in, in the US, it's a problem. 
I, and I imagine certainly other places too, you can see by all of the wars and so forth. But um, uh, anyway, one more thing I was going to share. Um, a woman, who, a wonderful woman who was a spiritual teacher to me um, earlier in my life, in my 20s and 30s. Um, wonderful, strong, um, independent, un never married woman who um, gave her life to spirituality. And she used to say, more love, love more. <laughs> and I don't know, all of this has made me think about this. Um, again, a, a simple thing, but I think pretty profound. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, hi, um, I made a few notes uh, shortly after the last meeting, actually, I think, about each point, and um, I put that the essence of trust lies in the belief that actions we trust to embark on will turn out as we expect them to, and that people we trust will cause no harm, and I was thinking about our group and how trust has grown between us as we've got to know each other. And um, trust does not involve any selfishness. It's always bringing other people into your life. And on the inhibition, I put a person who is inhibited will feel unable to feel free to act or speak exactly as they want to, as an inhibition curbs speech and behavior. But trust can, of course, lower inhibitions. And the third point, we are working to make um, human self-consciousness, uh, soul consciousness on Earth. And mankind can lift consciousness out of the personality vehicles. And once in the bud buddhic plane, thoughts, words and actions are auto automatically fine. I'd be and loving. The buddhic plane, the buddhic plane is based on true love and negative emotions are not recognized. People do become self con uh, soul conscious. Sorry, I always want to say self conscious. I don't I wonder why that is. Soul conscious. Uh, that's it. Thanks. I think the um, self-conscious is the true self, which is the soul, so I think. Ah, oh, yes. At one level, self-conscious and soul-conscious are the same thing. I hope so. <laughs> I'd like to just follow on a little bit with with the idea of the soul, I, I feel that trust is a quality of the soul. Um, and I think was, Lynn was talking about people um, telling you what, what to do, so you're, you're not free, but we, we can listen to our true self, the the soul. And I think one of the things with trust is to learn to trust what the soul is telling us or <clears throat> the information and understanding that is coming from the Buddhic plane. And if you if you have this trust in in the soul, your discrimination is better, I think. Um, if you you can hold on to that that trust, then you'll know that what you see 
and how you are observing it that that discrimination is is true. Truth also has a lot to do with uh, trust, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. When it comes to the uninhibited sharing of responsibility, again, I, I think soul, I think I'm right in saying responsibility is one of the first qualities uh, that come through with soul consciousness. And I think, work in that field, um, of the first law of healing about in uh, all disease or dis-ease is a result of inhibited soul life. So if we are, have uninhibited soul life, then there is no dis-ease. And certainly the lack of freedom, freedom of choice is a huge dis-ease for, for humanity. So I think that uninhibited soul life flowing and again, trusting that that, that soul light, that soul energy will work for the common good, really trusting that. Because sometimes the soul it, it doesn't always bring about what we thought it would, that increase in soul, soul light. Sometimes it shows up things that perhaps we'd rather not have, have seen. So we have to have that, that trust, too, in that uninhibited soul light. And the third question, you know, just thinking today in, in, in the UK, we've had a strange episode with with law with the with the judges in in the country coming up with a, a pronouncement really against the uh, government and it was uh, about uh, n not allowing human rights and uh, and to put this in, in the perspective that law is about human rights. It is about love. That, that is behind all the law and the justice systems. You know, they're they're heart-centered by their, their, their quality. And our, our government's response has been, well, we'll change the law. Uh, and you can't change the law. You know, the law is the law of love, and it, again, need the trust that it will prevail and that human rights and animal rights and plant rights and the Earth's rights are um, held there in the quality of the soul, the soul of the, the earth. Right, thank you. I'd like to share uh, a verse from Rudolf Steiner about trust. Um, it was shared with me by uh, Rebecca. It is a part of what we must learn in this age. To live out of pure trust without any security in existence. Trust in the ever-present help of the spiritual world. Truly nothing else will do if our courage is not to fail us. And let us seek the awakening from within ourselves every morning and every evening. This passage and verse um, 
It's really interesting because right now I, the world feels like it's the furthest it can possibly be from the spiritual life, you know, uh, acknowledging the spiritual world. You have pro soccer, the female that was just on the other day, she hurt herself, I guess, in the final play that she was going to play out her career in. And the first things that came out of her mind and uh, out of her mouth in the interview was, you know, well, there is no God and I don't believe, you know, that type of thing. And um, I think this quote is really interesting that Rebecca sent uh, about that we need to learn that the, uh, to trust in the ever present help of the spiritual world. I think that's something that really, really needs to be stoked in humanity again, and not from the religious standpoint because that was so Piscean um and I'm hoping again I I always talk about quantum uh physics but I do think that that's the key for this um century or at least at the beginning of the century um is learning about the spiritual world not through religion but through um through quantum that it's you know being proven so that people won't just blow off God, you know, ah, there's no God, whatever, you know, if there was, this wouldn't happen to me, but maybe there was a God and that's why it happened to you. I mean, you can go both sides of the coin, but I think when you're not playing that game, the old Piscean game, and you start looking at literally the world of spirit, that which isn't matter, like dense matter and start looking into the etheric and that, and I do think that that's going to come about and that will boost some sort of confidence in humanity, a reminder. I think it'll be a real good stimulus to remind us who we are and where we come from, because the old way of doing it, you know, go, you know, through the Piscean age, that's, that's a done deal. I don't think there's so many, they, you know, that's, that's gone. So it's the knowing the knowing and the pouring forth of the waters of knowledge that will help bring that spiritual world. Um, and then people will start to trust in it because they will realize it's, it's true. It's real, you know, so thank you. Thanks Rebecca for sharing that, even though she's not with us, but that was an excellent verse. Thank you. And you know, Tracy, um, the quantum that puts the responsibility right back on onto us, doesn't it? That's a really good point, Lynn, because the old Piscean age was you go to the priest and you ask for forgiveness. It's always that going somewhere else and not that direct line to God. So yeah, big difference. I think, uh, we're going to see a, a a change. It's, you know, it's happening now, but it's not, it's hidden by all the other stuff that they're putting out there that they want to misdirect everybody's attention to. So, yeah. And I think that's where you'll see the shared joy and commonality instead of the shared sorrow. Tracy, could you possibly read that uh, sentence again from Rebecca? Yeah, sure. Hold on one second. Let me pull it up. It is part of what we must learn in this age to live out of pure trust without any security in existence. Trust in the ever present help of the spiritual world. Truly, nothing else will do if our courage is not to fail us. And let us seek the awakening from within ourselves every morning and every evening.
I think it's very difficult for people who are not on the spiritual path at the moment to trust that things are going to work out well. And uh, they have those that can accept it and not be fearful and worry all the time are to be admired because um, the world is in a precarious position. And I remember back way back when, um, I think it was the Cuba crisis and the Cold War was on and goodness knows what. I was, uh, I suppose I was a teenager or in my 20s, I can't remember. But anyway, whatever it was, I was so afraid. I cried myself to sleep every night and ended up with clinical depression. So I sort of admire people that are holding on to their sanity at this time. Um, I think, Helen, you are so right to bring it all back to the soul. And um, um, trying to um, help birth soul awareness for everyone, however we can, um, however we can aid in that. And I know, I, I'm, I truly believe that everything we say here, I know you all do, helps so much because, um, well, for one reason is that um, I think the devas at all levels that make up everything in the, in the sense of the bodies of all things, the matter of all things, respond to sound. And when we say our ideas out loud, um, it, it really makes a difference in as long as we go through um, the higher spiritual consciousness all these ideas are made manifest through the sound we bring forth as we speak them. Um, uh, I just was thinking about that last week. And um, it's so wonderful to be part of this work, to even think that I have a small place here. And um, we surely have built a lot of trust, I think. And uh, um, if love is going to... Um, um, manifest more and more as we're hoping, as it seems to be doing. Um, this this is the good work to be doing right now. Uh, I, I also try to think of ways to um, bring forth on the material plane. Um, um, but but nonetheless, you know, whatever we speak uh, is certainly is certainly helping the situation. Um, and all the little lives are falling into line because of that, because of it, I think, at least a lot of them. Anyway, I'm going on and on. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. That's um, immediately I thought, yep, you're right. That seventh ray. Uh, ceremonial order and magic I think that's that our group is really um really uh using that seventh ray energy to help as much as we can you know create on the physical plane so thanks for sharing that Like Lynn, I love Helen's reference back to the first law of esoteric healing, inhibited soul life is what causes disease, as it says. But inhibited soul life is messing up the whole world. I mean, if we were, which sort of everything we're talking about now, the ills of the world are inhibited soul life where people can't love, can't trust can't forgive, can't, well, they're crippled to do anything positive to help their fellow man. Uh, but if there's a rays of hope, the, the tactica adversa in the Agni Yoga, they say that even monsters are here for a lesson, but they can be done away with by a ray 
I think it's a ray of light. Helen, do you remember ray of light? And so what is the ray of light? And I keep asking, it's everything we're talking about here and everything you've brought up. And again, Tracy, that little remark you just read, the sentence was, it's all leading back to heart and strength of the belief in what you feel in your heart and the courage to step forward in it and go on and, well, thank you. And as for the law, Helen, in England, I hadn't heard the result yet. That's most interesting. Exactly, if the law can't support humanity, the common good. Anyway, I'm going on, so thank you. And I was just saying the law did support the uh, common good and the the rights of of human of human beings, but the the government thought it would change the law. Um, I I just whilst people have been been speaking, I I just wanted to just drop in the word uh, telepathy because I I sense that. Our telepathic capacity, ability, is increasing enormously. And that as we become more conscious of the uh, etheric and, and its ability to, to share and, and this flow between all human beings and all kingdoms of the earth, that telepathy is, is sharpening. I just find it in... In everyday life, the point is sometimes quite quite amusing when I, I pick up a thought. I mean, it's not always very profound, but uh, quite often I think it is. And I think we are all of us um, becoming more in telepathic rapport at soul level. So I just wanted to drop that word telepathy in. Uh, this is Judy. Um, I've been thinking about trust, but on a much more basic level. Um, and when I look at these three words, trust, unity, and love, it almost needs to be love, trust, and then unity. Um, I think about Maslow's stages, and trust has to be basically developed within the first seven years of life. You have to trust that when you cry, somebody is going to respond. I mean, it's the basis of relationship, if you will, to feel that uh, someone is going to relate to you, uh, someone loves you, and I'm going to put love in, in quotes, uh, that you can trust that a need is going to be met. And uh, I think when you can develop trust on the very basic level of being responded to, then you can respond back. Um, so I think um, that, you know, love has to be felt for trust then to blossom. And uh, once that trust is there, then um, you can trust and accept someone else. Uh, then you can trust in turn. Um, and without that trust in relationship, there can be no unity. So it, it's like one falls upon the other, but the basis of everything really is to initially feel love. Uh, the word responsibility, sharing responsibility, brings 
uh, a note of um, awakened soul because uh, when the soul awakens the recognition of unity uh, comes and with that comes the sense of responsibility. And I think it uh, is an important marker uh, for us when we think about uh, the new group of world servers, and especially when we uh, speak to others, the, those whom we recognize a part of the new group of world service to express the essence of what is this group about. And I think it's important to talk about this now and preferably uh, talk about it in a way that it's more resident to uh, people of this time. And uh, I think this is one of the most um, resonant ways to explain that what is that what unites people who belong to this group it's that sense of responsibility and another thing that I thought that it's uh, about um, trust um, and uh, about and also about the third uh, question um, here is that for for us uh, for students of ageless wisdoms, it's essential to to not just know but to trust that plan exists. And that things uh, that happen in the world, no matter how horrendous they are, they that's certain aspect of the plan unfolds through that as well, and that's um, when we recognize suffering unfolding that it's quite possible that it's a way for uh, us collectively as humanity to learn through that suffering in order to recognize uh, love. We still have to come through that pain and so it's for us to not to lose the trust and recognize the plan. As you were speaking, Alexander, I couldn't help but think also that that um, um, I, and I agree one hundred percent with what you're saying about the suffering. And I think when we have opportunities to alleviate suffering, that probably opens the door in those who are being helped to uh, for trust and love to begin to enter in, um, just by being helped. Um, um, I, I am also concerned about people who um, aren't necessarily going through so much physical suffering, but now who are psychologically suffering. Um, I have a family member right now who um, is having uh, panic attacks and, and various psychological um, 
circumstances in his life that make him very uncomfortable and uh, um, very unhappy and uh, somewhat desperate. And um, he uh, has been one of those people who his whole life has been very scientific and not involved in religion, not involved in spirituality, just very straightforward and responsible. He was a teacher, a high school teacher. So it was very much an intellectual sort of thing in a really good school. And now he's having all these other experiences. And I think telepathy is part of it because he can't help but be bombarded by all of these new energies that we're all being bombarded with. And it's really thrown him off. And um, his son-in-law even had uh, uh, a mental breakdown um, and uh, um, that handled it very differently than he is. And it's, uh, it's, it's been a real challenge. And they, tried, they took him through all kinds of medical tests and this and that and could find nothing. And all along I thought, well, <laughs> I think I know, but I don't, I can't say, I don't think it's physiological, but um, anyway, um, so here I am in the background thinking, well, is there some way I can help? And, and so every once in a while I offer something and it hasn't ever been taken up uh, yet that, it, that he wants anything, any interaction, special interaction with me. So I just mention it. And then maybe a year later or a few months later, if we're together again and, it, the opportunity is there. I mentioned some little hint again, and I'm still hoping that sometime he'll take me up on it or that he'll look into these things for himself. It doesn't have to be me, of course. He just starts looking into those things himself. And um, the sort of um, things you can't see, the spiritual sorts of things that are having such a big effect. But one thing I found that might be helpful if other people are in this sort of situation um, on TED Talks. I don't know if people can get them everywhere in the world, but here we have something called TED Talks and various people um, go on, they're accepted and they go on and give maybe a 20 minute talk about something amazing. Uh, might be something they're studying in science or something, you know, experience they've been doing or experience they had. Uh, it can be any sort of thing that's that's um, um, reveals things at a deeper level, and that are, they think will be interesting to people. But there's one one particular one. It's called My Stroke of Insight. That's its title, My Stroke of Insight. It's a Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor who gives it, and she uh, studied the brain. She's um, she was even at Harvard for a while. She's a very well-respected scientist who who studied, I don't know, I can't be more particular about it, but she was studying the brain. And um, she had, uh, when she was getting ready for work, she had a stroke. Only it, uh, it was a stroke only on the left side of her brain. So she It sort of was better and worse, better and worse. And she would try to figure out what to do. But all she had was her right side of her brain. And what she was seeing with the right side of her brain was the lack of materiality of the whole world. How she could look at her and see how empty really it was, how much space there was between cells and how vague the outside lines of her arm really were, how they blended with the universe and everything around her. She was sensing the whole universe. It was a truly spiritual experience because she was having a stroke on the left side of her brain. And she came on and described that to people. And um, if you wanna look for it yourself, it's called again, My Stroke of Insight. Um, she, the whole spiritual world opened up to her and has, she's of course never been the same since. And by the end of her speech, she was in tears. The whole thing was so, so moving. She was saying it would, all we need to do is recognize um, the true self in each of us, how easy it would be for all of us to get along and solve all the world's problems, you know, this sort of thing. And she was actually in tears. It's very, very moving. Um, anyway. 
<laughs> moving to the heart and the soul. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks, Lynn. I saw that a while ago. And yeah, that was that was an excellent TED talk. Um, I keep going back to how can mankind bring forth new ways? What how can we bring new ways to master love? And from what everybody's just said, um well, between Lynn and, and Alexander and and everyone, um the word detachment non-attachment and Lynn like your your relative who's having a hard time he's very uh, mental thinking left brain it's called detachment from thoughts um, once we learn to detach from these attachments we can then not be inhibited and become uninhibited so by detachment and especially for the fifth root race and that it's all about the mental body and development and everything but we need to learn to detach also from that so that we can move into the buddhic plane and bring in like everybody was talking about the heart centered um and i think detachment is huge in the healing of humanity um, that we need to learn how to detach from, you know, everything, our thoughts, our our, our views, our uh, just, you know, and, and it's hard because we're in a physical body. We, you know, we have our perceptions um, and our beliefs and, and, and we need, again, this Piscean age, this belief, that's what kept us enmeshed into this physical world. And it's time for us to move out of the physical world um, and back into a little bit more of the spiritual world, but blending the two. So I think the key word uh, for me, how mankind can bring forth new ways, the way they bring it forth is through non-attachment. So thanks for that, Lynn. That was brought that to mind. Thank you, Tracy. We're approaching the time to, uh, for the meditation. And before that, I want to ask if anyone who didn't have a chance to share yet would like to do this. So please. Let us now hold, continue holding this pause, bringing our focus on seed thoughts and the most resonant ideas that have been shared in this circle. And think about those that uh, we would like to offer into our group chalice, the meditation. And um, or in a uh, minute of reflective silence, Tracy will lead us in meditation. Okay. Let us move into silence. Become aware of the stillness within.
align with your heart and your soul. And from your soul, let's link with the group heart, the group mind, and the group soul. The heightened vibration and love that we hold within our group now draws the presence of higher vibrational beings who are here to guide and assist the energy and thought forms we will be magnetizing. Let us now link with the hierarchy, connecting with them through our group onto Karana, thus linking the heavens and the earth, the inner world of meaning, and the outer world of subtle glamour. Visualize before us the glowing beauty of our chalice with which our work together feeds and fills. This golden chalice is made of numerous threads of lighted golden energy that we have provided as we have stood together in contemplation of our lighted thoughts. As we place our focus together here, we are motivated by the energies of Scorpio at this time. We know that everything has its purpose and that nothing is permanent. Always in a flux of continuous glowing change, morphing from the inflow and outflow of the energies which surround us at the time. We are now in the new moon of Scorpio on the fixed cross. Scorpio supports changes through trial and tests, which bring us to our knees. We find that only through death the surrendering of our grip on the world of glamour and its illusions, can we succeed in realizing a new angle of vision, a clear and higher angle of vision. We learn now to transform fear through knowledge and understanding. And separateness and hatred to oneness and love. Through warrior energy provided by Mars, the esoteric ruler of Scorpio, we move from being foot soldiers to spiritual warriors, soaring high and free as an eagle.
So let us now reconnect with our topic. Sharing responsibility through trust, unity, and love. Take a few moments in silence to reflect on all that has been said, as well as our responses. We ask the hierarchy to guide and inspire us as we allow our thoughts to crystallize, grasping the essence of the purpose of our work throughout this cycle of Scorpio. And with love, we offer our efforts into the chalice, each one unmuting and speaking as you are moved to. We also honor those who choose not to speak, but who silently offer their formulated seeds into the chalice. After each vocalized offering, let us allow each seed to rest in silence 
for a while before the next one is offered. Let us begin. Uh, may we always work with sincerity of purpose to maintain trust. The increase of telepathy opens the door for detachment from concrete thoughts and uh, thus to spiritual awakening. Trust creates right relations and link us with the one so. Let the command of the Lord go forth. The end of woe is come. Together with this is my command that you love one another. Love builds trust, which inspires responsibility and manifests unity. This is the soul expressing the common good. Trusting in the love of soul, we respond to the world with love. We lift all pain and suffering of humanity to the light of the soul and trust that the plan is working out. We see that Annette wrote in the chat, 
May we all get soul contact. Humanity together as a unit learns non-attachment, which is healing, freeing, and releases our bond to the lower worlds. We focus on the purpose of our work today and the seeds collected, allowing them to vibrate and resonate within the embracing light of our group vessel. We magnetize it now with the light of Scorpio. We invoke the will to good to empower our group intention. We lift our chalice towards the hierarchy, offering it as group service to the plan. We turn toward humanity and offer our group service to support the collective evolution of mankind. To seal and complete our work together today, let us sound the great invocation. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into human minds. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, 
let love stream forth into human hearts. May Christ descend on earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide all little human wills. The purpose the masters know and serve. From the center which we call humanity, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Oh.